Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Okay, I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. Come on, stand to your feet. Let's go before the Lord. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. And we thank you, Father, that tonight we have come to hear what the Spirit of the Lord would have to say. Speak to us tonight. Here's our hearts. Fill us with your ways, your will, your want, your desire. Lord, get us out of our own way so that we can bring more of you in. And we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. Lord, as you bless us today, we would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center. Thank you for the Assemblies of God, Foursquare Denomination, Lord. We're so, we're so grateful, Father, for our Catholic and our Adventist brothers and sisters. Thank you for Emmanuel Baptist and Trinity and Ecclesia Church. May the Spirit of God fall on them and all those that are preaching the gospel all over this valley as he would us and will give you the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. Amen. Tonight I'm just going to share with you from my heart some principles out of the word of the Lord that seem so simple but so overlooked by people. Look, the bottom line is just this. We pastors that pastor the Rock Church World Outreach Center are in love with you. Bottom line is this, is we care more about you than you can possibly ever imagine. You probably never had anybody stand in front of you and just say simply, I love you. I love you enough to tell you the truth. I love you enough not to beat around the bush. I love you enough to get in your face and say it like it needs to be said. I love you and respect you and honor you enough to believe that you can handle the word of God. You see, there's a purpose God has for you on this planet. God has gifted you, and you don't even know, for most of you that are in here, the giftings that you have that are literally lying dormant on the inside of you. God has placed you here to do something. There is a job, there's a destiny, there's a purpose for each and every one of us that are in here. Sometimes we get so caught up in the stuff of this life that we forget about what God's placed us here for. God, as I've said many times, could have literally gotten you saved and taken you out of this place to heaven. If that's all he had in mind was to take you to heaven. But he didn't. He left you here for a reason. And like I said last weekend, all weekend long, I don't want to just introduce you to Jesus and tell you how wonderful Jesus is and leave you there. That would be a tragedy. I want to introduce you to Jesus, yes, for those that need to be introduced. And I want to build him big in your heart, yes, for those that need him to be built big. But I also want to build inside of you the very character, nature, and attributes of God so that you can go forth and live your life to the very fullness that God has for you. Because until you live your life to the fullness that God has for you, you will never be satisfied. You will always be looking somewhere and something and for somebody and some other area of your life, looking for something to satisfy and fill you. And there's only one satisfaction and one fulfillment that you will find. And it's in the completion of what God has for you to do with how he made you. And sometimes that takes a long time to learn. Sometimes it takes a lot of faith to live. Sometimes it's going to take a lot of courage to withstand. Sometimes it's going to take just a whole attitude that comes from the word of God for you to live that kind of a life. I can say something about my Deborah and I. This morning we were walking around our home outside. It's warm, as you notice, like a winter day, right? And we were just holding hands before she went off to work. And we were just walking around outside. Squirrels were chasing each other like we got a yard for the squirrels. And um, I was sitting there watching them. 
just everywhere, you know. And Deb and I were just so filled in our life. I want to say this to you. So blessed in our life that both of us felt like falling literally on our face right on the front lawn, just weeping before God because life is so good. And I told Deborah, I said, that's why after all these years, I can preach with a passion because I'm not just telling you something that I haven't experienced. I'm telling you something that works. Not only does it work according to the scripture, but it works according to a man such as myself and a woman such as that who has lived this. And we want you to be successful. We want you to be fulfilled. We want you to be happy in every area of your life. It's a simple process. Absolutely simple, but most of the time it's overlooked by so many people. Tonight I want to share with you some principles of associations for the healthy Christian. I've really been beating the table about healthy. Last weekend it was all about healthy this and healthy that. And my job is not just to introduce you, but to keep you strong and keep you healthy in Christ. And here it is, not only did I say that all weekend long, but I'm saying it again tonight, this time, associations. Who you associate with is really what you will become. I want to say it again to you. It's all through the scripture. Old Testament as well as New Testament. Who and what you associate with is what you're going to become and what you're going to do. You associate with people who are not going for God, headed down the wrong path, you will eventually be down that path with them. And it won't be long before you're out there wondering, whatever happened, I don't go there anymore, I don't do that anymore, I don't believe that anymore. You find yourself a derelict with God. You don't have to do that. My father, who was a wise man, wasn't a very strong Christian, but a good guy, made a statement to me when I was a young boy. You finished the sentence. You've probably heard it yourself many times. Birds of a feather do what? Flock together. And it ought to be that way with us as Christians. We're going to be reaching out, talking to our neighbors, reaching out, talking to our relatives, reaching out, talking to our friends, and reaching out, talking to people. And sometimes in associations, we get so caught up trying to reach them that they actually reach us and bring us down and take us away from the things of God. You need to watch yourself. It's all right to be a witness, but it's not all right to follow them into their foolishness. Let me say it again. It's all right for you to be a witness. God wants you to be, but there's a difference between someone who is a witness and someone who is following people into their foolishness. Because you want to relate with them. You don't need to relate with them. They need to relate with you. You're the one that's carrying the proper association. You look all through the scriptures. God created everything after its own kind. You'll find that the squirrels hang around with other squirrels. There's a cat walked across the yard today. I don't know whose cat that is. Not my cat. Walked across the yard, and I didn't see one squirrel come down from the tree and hang out with a cat. It just doesn't happen. Do you know what I'm saying? It's just kind of like, stop and think about it. Even the kind of birds, you don't see a bunch of birds flying all over. They're all birds. They just hang out together, birds. They all hang out together. You, you know, the, the little sparrows hang out together, and the crows hang out together. You ever seen those big old flocks of crows flying over all the time? They go that way in the morning and that way at night. Where do they go? <laughs> Have you ever seen that besides, anybody ever notice that? You're staring there and it's like that billion crows, blackbirds just flying that way in the morning, that way at night. I mean, they're all, they're, they're not one sparrow in the whole group. There's not one parrot in the group, not one blue, but we, in Redlands they have parrots. There's, there's not a bunch of blue jays with the parrots. They're just all parrots. They go over and make the stupidest noises you've ever seen in your life. It's like they have like the, the, the crazy little undeveloped wings and they go flapping really fast, <laughs> making these noises, you know, it's like goofy. And they're all the same. Everything hangs out with what you are. 
In fact, you'll find that God spoke to Israel numerous times. He said, you don't hang out with the heathens. In fact, when they're in your land, you better get them out of your land because they will poison you. Why? Because the people weren't strong enough to stay away from the problem that they had. Over and over and over again, Old Testament, New Testament, associations are talked about oftentimes about proper developments. I'm grateful that I'm associated with a wild woman. Like I've said so many times before, the woman is like Isaiah the prophet's sister. Up in the middle of the night praying, prophesying, speaking in tongues. What is this? I'm snoring. You're pretty speaking in tongues. I'm speaking in nose. I'm just so unspiritual. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Some of you men know what I'm talking about. But I associate with somebody who's very spiritual, and it's really been a blessing in my life. Your associations mean so much to you. It means the difference between you being successful. I've said this before to you. You can almost talk to every single person that's ever come out of prison. They'll say, what mistakes did you make? Here's the mistake almost every one of them says. The people I hung around with were the wrong people that got me in trouble. And when you start to hang around the wrong people as Christians, your future is doomed. And that's what we do all the time, is we find people we relate with as far as fun, our interests, our compatibility, our age, our education, our economics, and we, we hang around them instead of comparing somebody who's got a spiritual base to them. And that's what we need to look for all the time in order to associate with. Without that, we're going to find ourselves literally failing in life. Now look, I'm only going to take you in your Bible to one book and I think six verses tonight. But I'm going to pop up a lot of verses for you on the overhead. So I want to just look at them just for yourself. Is that okay? Just look at the overheads with me and let's run quickly through a lot of verses tonight. Exodus 34, 12 says this words. Take heed to yourself. Least you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going. Least it be a snare to your midst. I should have underlined the word snare. In other words, here's God warning the children of Israel. When you go into the promised land, when you're going with some place that God has taken you, there's no difference between God taking you somewhere in your life. You've got to watch out who you associate with. And who you are making agreements with. Here he comes along and makes a statement. Look out. Watch yourself. Because it will be a snare. In fact, go there in Exodus. You're already there thinking about it. Let's just go back to Exodus the 23rd chapter. Verse number 2. It says, you shall not follow a crowd to do evil. I mean, stop and think about it. There's all crowds of people. I love this Occupy movement. Okay, uh uh-huh, that's great, wonderful. Nobody can figure out what you're even talking about. But let's uh, let's understand something. We're not following a crowd to do evil. We only follow that which goes on and does the things of God. Evil is any lifestyle contrary to the ways of God. Let me make it very clear for you one more time. Evil is any lifestyle contrary contrary to the ways of God. Let's take another look at the word of the Lord. Proverbs, fourth chapter, verse 14, just pop it up on the overhead. Do not enter into the path of the wicked and do not walk in the ways of the evil. So here we see this already over and over again. Stay out of the way of people that are contrary to the ways of God. I didn't say don't witness to them. I didn't say don't pray for them. I didn't say don't love them. I didn't say don't encourage them. I didn't say don't be there for them. But don't get in with them. Don't get in this personal thing with them that you do something that's contrary to the ways of God. It won't be long before that which is serving God no longer serves the Lord. And believe me, the wrong relationships, wrong associations take everybody down the tube. That's why God is warning over and over and over again. I only pulled out a few out of probably 20 or 30 of them I could have picked out. Let's go to the New Testament. Fun, 1 Corinthians 5th chapter, verse number 11. Just pop it up on the overhead. It says this, But now I have written unto you not to keep company with anyone named a brother 
who is sexually immoral or covetous or idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Well, that really is making a statement. In other words, you can witness to them, you can love them, you can pray for them, but he's not telling you to have some intimate relationship with these people. They will eventually take you down the tubes. I'll tell you when you have an intimate relationship with people that are not serving God is when they finally commit their heart to Jesus and they need help and are ready to hear the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then an intimate relationship comes. Then there's a binding power and a help and a support. But even then you've got to watch yourself that they don't pull you back. Are you following me now? Results of a bad association. There's three of them I want to bring to your attention tonight. Let me say it again. Results of a bad associations. There are three results that happen in Scripture with bad associations. Why am I saying this to you? Just to kind of get you to see the importance of not having bad associations, but looking for good associations. Are you following me? Here's number one. Personal corruption. It'll take you down a road you don't want to go until you are finally corrupted. In fact, the word of the Lord says in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse 33, do, you, do not be deceived. That means I could be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. In other words, I could hang around the wrong company of people and eventually it will corrupt my commitment to Jesus Christ. It'll corrupt my heart. It'll corrupt my life. I need to be around people who are going to help me and encourage me. That's why small groups are important. That's why us getting to church all the time is important, at least a couple of times a week. I really believe that with all of my heart, just to be around other believers and notice the very first thing, do not be deceived. Can I tell you something? When you hear the Bible say, don't be deceived, he's not telling you that because you couldn't be deceived. He's telling you that because you can be deceived and he doesn't want you to be deceived and he's warning you about what not to step in. You're going down a path and there's poop in there way. You don't want to step in it. And God says, don't be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Is anybody listening? And it'll corrupt your life. It'll take you and warp your thinking and warp your heart. And you'll not be what God would have you to be, a strong, healthy Christian. Can I tell you something? Listen to me right now. I know this is shocking to you, but if you read your Bible on what kind of a Christian is in the Bible, it's a radical Christian. It's radical Christianity. It's wholehearted Christianity. I didn't say crazy I might be crazy in the eyes of the world. I didn't say goofy. I didn't say might be goofy in the eyes of the world. I didn't say doing stupid things that are, you know, that are ungodly and un uh, unrighteous. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about radical Christianity. We're just absolutely in the word of God. The word says it. We believe it. I, I, it doesn't seem right to others, but I'm going to live that way anyway. And that's radical Christianity. And somebody needs to tell you. But anything that's evil will corrupt that wholehearted desire to go on with God. If you've got a desire to go on with God, and you know, listen to me now, you know that where you're at today is where you're not going to be next year. Next year you're going to be more fired up for Jesus than this year. Could you just wave at me for a moment? Let me see who's out there that wants to go on with God. Guess what? Then you cannot afford to have a relationship with evil company. It'll corrupt you. Second thing we've seen, we're talking about results of a bad association. It's personal irritation. It'll irritate you on such a basis that it will, it will just cause you just to be uncomfortable all the time. Personal irritation. In fact, in Numbers, the 33rd chapter, verses 55, 56, last two verses of the, of, of the chapter. It says, but if you do not drive out the inhabitants, go back to this Old Testament, if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall be that those who let remain shall be irritants to your eyes and thorns in your sides, and they shall 
harass you in the land where you dwell. Moreover, it shall be that I will do to you as, as I thought to do to them. Man, that is like crazy. Nobody needs that personal irritation. I tell you what, I have seen more marriages that are Christian marriages bust up because somebody is not getting rid of a friend that's irritating to the family relationship. In other words, there's a, somebody out there between husband or wife, whether it's the wife or the husband, won't give up an evil association because they're all buddy stuff. And can I tell you something? That buddy stuff gets in and it becomes an irritant to the marriage and eventually the marriage fails. I've seen it a hundred times if I've seen it once in marriage today. It's personally irritating and, and eventually it'll bring you to the place where you're judged just like them. You don't want that. You know it. That's why we're here. That's why we're bringing this subject up. Your associations are very important. If you don't have any, get some. It's for your own survival. Find some place to go. Go to girlfriends. Get in a table. Go to the men's meetings. Find somebody to talk to during the week. Get into some association. Be a partner with somebody to talk about Jesus with like we talked about last week. Results of a bad association, number one, personal corruption. Number two, personal irritation. Number three, personal departure. You're going to eventually leave the things of God. That's sad. First Kings, the 11th chapter, verse number two, let me read it to you. It says this, from the nations of whom, the, remember this is mostly Old Testament. God was setting up the children of Israel then. Do you think it's any different now? No. We're learning from their mistakes, my friends. From the nation of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you sh shall not remarry. You see the word uh, uh, intermarry? The word intermarry there means have personal relationship. They didn't know how to translate. They translated just marriage. Let me tell you something. You can have a personal relationship with somebody and not be married to them. It doesn't have to be a sexual personal marriage, uh, relationship. It could just be a personal marriage with somebody. And, and not be married to them. And, and, and listen to this. And it, and it says these words. And, it, and surely they will turn your hearts after their gods. Solomon had all of these wives. He starts off turned on to Jesus. Starts off writing scripture. Starts off the man of God. Builds the temple of God. My goodness sakes. His father David couldn't even build it. Now he starts messing around. Now listen to this. He had a thousand wives from all over the place. Don't blame the women. It could have been anything. It could have been a thousand cars. It could have been a thousand football games. It could have been a thousand baseball games. It could have been a thousand anything. It just happened to be women in those days. My goodness sakes, they didn't have uh, ESPN. <laughs> and he gets himself all hung up on something that he should have been with God about. And that took him away from the things of God. Today I stand before you. Don't even know if Solomon, if you'll ever see him in heaven, he might be in hell. And most likely, listen to me, this is a shock. Someone who wrote in the scriptures for us. So missed it that God most likely, most likely, I didn't say he is, because I'm not the judge. Most likely he is in hell. That's a shock. How did it happen? Here's how it happened. He got something else in the place of God, some personal desire, some personal want, some personal thing, some personal passion that took the place and took him out of his place in his living relationship with the living God. And it took him away and it personally corrupted him, personally irritated him, and personally caused a departure. And that's what happens when you have the wrong associations. Are you following me? Why would I say these things to you? Because I love you. Because we're all subject to this. He didn't write this in the scripture because we're not all, including me. Every one of us in here need to watch ourselves, who we personally hang around with, who we put an emphasis in, whose ears do we, whose voice do we turn our ears over to? 
Is it someone talking about lifting up the name of Jesus? Or is it someone just putting down the world and negative down, depressed, discouraged, and frustrated? Even though they might be right in terms of the world, they're wrong in terms of the things of God. Be wise enough to discern the difference. Now, I want to take you somewhere with your Bible. Go with me to Psalms, the first chapter. Blessed, it starts off. I don't know about you, but wave at me if you want to be blessed. Sure you do. The rest of you that don't want to be blessed are either liars, you didn't hear, or you fell asleep on me. <laughs> Let's try that again. Wave at me if you, raise your hands if you want to be blessed. You people out there are live streaming right now. God's watching you. Just get your hand up. You know you want to be blessed. I mean, how in the world would you stay up in the middle of the night to watch this service if you didn't want to be blessed? You want to be blessed too. Just put your hand up. It's okay. We'll join you. Everybody wants to be blessed. Put your hand up. He starts off verse number one. Psalms, the first chapter. Go ahead, pop it up. Let's take a look at it. Blessed is the man. Oh, now when it starts off that way, I want to find out how to get blessed. I want to find out. I mean, I read that. That's not just talking about somebody else. See, when you start to think that scripture is talking about somebody else and it doesn't really apply to you, you miss the scripture. Follow me? It says, blessed is the man. I could just put my name in there. Blessed is Jim. Yeah, amen. Go ahead and give me a bigger amen than that, sister. I wanted to make you an elder in the church with that big amen. You're the only one that got it. Blessed is Jim. Mm hmm. That's what I'm saying. What are you saying? So you're reading that like, blessed is the man, some other guy. I don't give a flip about that other guy. You shouldn't give a flip about that other guy either. I was reading a long time ago. That guy's dead. <laughs> Blessed is Jim. All right, I'm going to say this. You put your name in there. Is that okay? One, two, three. Blessed is. I heard you. <laughs> you know you want it. Who walks. You see the word walks? It's kind of an interesting little verse. Notice how it has it walks, and then he has stands and sits. If you can figure out something else that a man does, let me know. Maybe lays. Walks, stands, sits. Okay, now watch this. Walks. The word walks in Scripture always means living out life. Blessed is a man who lives out life not in the counsel of the ungodly. How many times do we hear something from the ungodly and it just affects us? Did you ever notice how it affects your faith? Have you ever, have you ever watched television and you heard a depressing report and your heart sunk? Now everybody, right? Every, every one of us have done that. And it's like, oh man, I wonder what's going to happen. Oh, the economy. The nation is 9%. The nation needs to tune into San Bernardino. We're like 28%. And can I tell you something? We're still making it. Not very good, not, not in abundance, but we're making it. Blessed is a man who lives out life. Not, not, not. I should have highlighted the word not. And now he's going to tell you the negative stuff. In other words, a man that doesn't mess around with the counsel of the ungodly ungodly always wants to speak in your life. Here's the problem. Then a godly man, um, you know, watch this, watch this. Then a godly man, I'm, I'm doing this, are you catching this? And then a godly man wants to speak in your life and you put up a wall. Hello? It says, if you're taking counsel from the ungodly, I'm the godly. How do you know? Because I'm not talking about myself. I'm not talking about my ideas and my philosophies, my ideologies. If I was, then shoot me, man. Drag me out of here. Pick up one of those chairs and hit me with it. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. I'm talking about his word. 
You ought to be able to easily understand that I'm a godly man talking about godly things. Oh, no, but we got this big wall of resistance up. You never know. I'm not going to you know, listen to that guy. Well, all you have to do is to say this. Here's, we're not to listen to ungodly men. We're not to live our life by that. That means a godly man comes along, you ought to listen to what they have to say. Amen. Nor stands. I thought stands was an interesting word. That means make a commitment. Makes a commitment in the path of the sinner. I, listen, I'm going the way they're going. Not going to do that. Nor sits. You know what sits means? Getting comfortable in the seat where they're at. So you're not to live out your life. You're not to make a commitment. And you're not to listen to these words. You're, you're not to get comfortable in anything that's contrary to the ways of God. If you ever get comfortable in something that's contrary to the ways of God, you need to really slap yourself. And that's where accountability comes in and have an association with somebody who can pray you and help you, encourage you, develop you, and get you out of there and get you where you need to be. Yeah. Am I preaching to myself? Come on. But that's only the first verse. Verse number two comes along, and I like verse number two. But, <laughs> when verse number two starts off with the word but, that means something good's happening. It means all of a sudden there's a transition. That there's, there's bad things. You don't want to listen to them. There's good things. You get blessed if you listen to the good things. But listen to this. Verse number two, but his delight, speaking of the blessed man, is in the law of the Lord and his law, speaking of God's. Now, can I just stop you? When you see the word law there, you're not talking about the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Not talking about that. The law of the Lord is the word of God. Follow me here. We get all messed up because of the word law. Moses gave the law to the children of Israel. That's different than the law of the things of God when God's word speaks. So many people are so novice in their Christian walk. When they see that up there, they delight in the law of the Lord. I guess I got to keep the Ten Commandments. not talking about that. He's talking about you hearing what God has to say and living your life by that. And listen to this. His law, he meditates day and night. Now, you cannot meditate God's word day and night. Sorry. You can't do it. Can't do it. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is that you're so involved in it, that's your passion day in and day out. Go ahead and try it. Go ahead and try to think about God's word all day, every day, all night, all the time. I, I, I'm pretty turned on. I've been pretty turned on over all these years. I used to read that and teach that, boy, we just got to put our mind on the thing. You can't do that. You can live in this world. You live in this world of television. You live in the world of Disneyland. You live in the world of freeways. You live in the world of neighbor's dogs pooping on your front lawn. You live in all kinds of this world. You're, you're not going to say, oh, there's the dog going pooping on my front lawn. I, I just got the word of God on my mind. You'd be an idiot. What he's talking about is talking about a passion all the time, day in and day out. Man, the things that God has to say is, listen to this, what you live your life by. Come on. You didn't get it, did you? You didn't get it, did you? See, the passion, you're not going to think, meditate, 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 the word of the Lord, word of the Lord. You can't do that. You just won't do it. Forget it. You can't do it. Someone comes along and tells you that. They don't understand what's being said. What's saying is your passion. Above every one of your feelings, above your own desires, above your own thinking, above your own everything, above what everybody else says in the world says to you, your passion is his thing, his word, his will, his desire, his thou. Now, that's, that's meditating. Day and night, man, I'm turned on to God. That's what he's talking about. Then he comes along, verse number three. He shall be, oh, and I like this. Notice how just a little bit of don't walk, don't sit, don't stand. And then all of a sudden now we've got three verses about good things. 
that will bless you. Simple as this. Don't get involved in somebody else's sin and error. And now the, now the blessings. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I mean, what could be cooler for a tree than have your roots go to where there's nourishment? Isn't that what this is all about? I mean, how, how, what God is describing there is like continuous nourishment. And that means, what I said earlier, a life of fulfillment. Now watch this. Then he comes along and says, that brings forth fruit in its season. Doesn't miss a season? Doesn't fall from a season? Doesn't come early? Doesn't misdevelop? I have these uh, trees in front. You know, I go out in these little peach trees. I think every year, man, there's going to be great little peach trees. And they look like they're drying up. They're like miserable. They're, they're horrible. I, I water them. I fertilize them. Finally, a guy says, you can do all that stuff. You've got to spray them in the winter to get them ready for the spring. I said, well, I'm not spraying anything in the winter. It's too cold. <laughs> not this one. So you've got to get ready. Now, here he comes along and says, in its season. In other words, all the time perfectly producing. Fulfillment, we're talking about. I could do anything, if I could do anything for you as a pastor, I want to take you to a place of looking at life at the end of your life and saying, wow, I'm fulfilled. Whew. Not just got by, I didn't just make it. Thank God for my social security. I hope you elect the right president that keeps it going. Oh, I just th forget that stuff, man. I got better, I got eternal security. And it, oh, it's a whole lot better than social security. <laughs> Whose leaves also, I love the word also in there, shall not wither. So that means the leaves also. So the rest of the tree doesn't wither. The fruit doesn't wither. Also the leaves, even the most vulnerable part. A leaf turns like with nothing and wind comes and blows it away. And it says, and whatever he does, I love this part, he shall, that's a promise from God. Yeah. Debbie and I have lived our life Oftentimes, uh, uh, it, it's amazing, lived our lives where middle of the night get up and just pray and believe God. We morning, noon, and night talk God all the time. We try to talk other things. I try to talk a lot of other things. But, she, you know, but we always get back to but the bottom line. We'll talk that other stuff for a little while, but then we get back to Jesus Christ. And it's all the time, morning, noon, and night, meditating his word. His word's the most important thing. And he shall prosper. I'm going to tell you, standing before you, I'm a prosperous man. I'm not talking about economics. I'm not talking about money in my pocket. Don't run out of here and say, oh, Pastor Jim's got a lot of money in the pocket. I'm not talking about money in the pocket. A prosperous man, man, his family is blessed. Life is blessed. Their health is blessed. Their future is blessed. Their children's blessed. Their grandchildren's blessed. Give me a break, man. That's a prosperous man. Whew. Verse 4. We're finishing up, so hold on. The ungodly. Now, finally, goes to the ungodly. Are not so. In other words, what he just said about the tree planted by the rivers of water, fruit in their season, leaves won't even wither, not prosperous. The ungodly. So, But why would we follow the ungodly? Why would we even listen to the ungodly? It's like crazy, but the warning comes to us because we do. Did you hear me? Yeah. Did you hear me? Yeah. The warning comes to us because we do. And we're not to do that. It says the ungodly are not so, but like the shaft which the wind drives away, the shaft of wheat. Just once they, the grain shaft is taken off the grain, they throw the shafts in the air, the, the grain comes down, the wind blows the shaft away. The shaft is worthless. There's no nutrition in it. There's nothing but like a husk around that little seed that was going to be ground up and made out of bread and whatever needed. The shaft is nothing, and so like a shaft. In other words, he's saying that people that do not serve God become like shafts of nothing. 
They live out their life and it's meaningless, has no purpose. They existed, but they didn't produce anything. They were not like a tree planted by the river. They were not bringing their fruit and production in every season that's perfect and pure. They were not people who ever did anything whatsoever. They didn't prosper in anything. And their leaves withered up. And you can look at them and see that. That's not you. Because you're not going to be like a shaft. Verse number 5 comes along. Take a look at it. So, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. Let me tell you something about when God judges things. You'll stand before God, the Bible says. And all of your works will pass before the Lord. 1 Corinthians 3rd chapter. All of your works. The Bible says he'll put fire to them. Some will be wood, hay, and stubble. In other words, when fire hits wood, hay, and stubble, all of your good deeds burn up, mean nothing. But others of your works that's in God will be gold, silver, and precious stones. So when fire hits gold, silver, and precious stone, it stays. (laughs) But you will stand in the day of judgment. But the ungodly can't stand in the day of judgment nor the sinner in the congregation of the righteous. There's a day when there's a congregation of the righteous in heaven that will be called in there and a sinner won't be able to stand. Man, I don't want to be part of that. So why would we listen to that? Why would we get involved in that? Why would we have a relationship with that? You know, the Bible says in the New Testament, what are you doing with sin? Nothing, righteousness has no place with unrighteousness. Why are you unequally yoked? That's what he's telling you. It's what he's telling me. All of a sudden, verse number six comes along. Let's take a look at it. For the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. God's warning you and God's warning me. If we don't get our act together and realize that we can do this, God wouldn't tell us that we could do this if we couldn't do it. We can. Sure, it's going to be hard. Sure, it's going to be tough. Sure, it's going to be different. It's hard to be a witness and not try to get into a relationship with the people that you're having a witness with. But be the minister. Don't be the buddy friend and hang around them and have them suck you back down the toilet. Be the minister that God's called you to. God hasn't called you to be their fool. But the way of the ungodly shall perish. Case closed. So tonight... For all of us that are in here, associations for a healthy Christian, we really need each other, desperately. We need to hang around each other. We need to encourage each other. We need to come in and clap. We need to have fun together. We need to listen to someone say amen over there real loud. And someone shout over here or, or something. We need to enjoy our time together as Christians. Because as soon as we leave this place, man, the rubber meets the road and the world is out there telling you what to do. You don't believe me? Go home and turn on the television. Every vampire on the planet is on television and winning Academy Awards. Tell me how screwed up that is. Blood suckers are absolutely, they're camped out around theaters. How, how screwed up is our generation? They're camped out for weeks around theaters trying to get it. Where are you guys going? I walked in. What's going on here? Oh, the latest vampire movie's out, man. Eee, eee. I want you to know something. You know, give me that. Eee. I'm going to slap you right in the face. as you. I'm just going in here to see a Mickey Mouse movie here. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Slap you in the face, repent later. <laughs> Cast the devil right out. No, I didn't. <laughs> the whole point, your associations is what you will become. You associate with turned on, strong, healthy Christians that love the word of God. Listen to me. How simple is this? I promise you, and so does God, a future of fulfillment and success, happiness, peace, joy, love, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, temperance, meekness, all of those fruit of the Spirit will just pile on your life, and your life will be so blessed that people want to know who you are. All you have to do 
is hang out with the Word of God with passion and hang out with other Christians who can, like we said from Sunday, encourage you forward, not suck you backwards. Come on, somebody. Healthy. Healthy Christians is what this church is out for. Well, if God spoke to you today, give the Lord a great big praise. You know that? Isn't that cool? I want to make sure everybody's all right with God. Then I'm going to open this pulpit up for prayer. So here's what I need you to do. Some of you that are out here, I'm not going to do our traditional altar call. You know you're out of sync with God. Hear me. Nudge the person next to you. Just nudge the person next to you. Go ahead, give them an elbow. Wake them up. You know you're out of sync with God. Now listen to me. You need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your life. You need to be born again, headed for heaven. That's what Jesus said. You cannot get to heaven because you're nice. You cannot get to heaven because you go to church once in a while. You cannot get to heaven because you quote scripture. You cannot get to heaven because you're a good person. You cannot get to heaven because you've been christened or baptized as a baby. Your mom and dad took you to catechism, Sunday school or Sabbath school class when you were a child. It ain't going to work. You're not going to make it. Jesus said, I am the way, truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. Well, that's a bizarre statement. He's either God or he isn't God. He proved himself to be God. The tomb's empty. Sitting at the right hand of the Father for 2,000 years and every bit of the scripture for thousands of years have come to pass and proved himself to be God. Now listen closely to what I'm saying to you. Tonight is your night of salvation. Tonight you need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your life. While you're sitting in your seat right there, if that's you, I won't embarrass you, but I want you to raise your hand if you need Jesus and to give him all your heart and all your life and you want to stop messing with God. Thank you. There's one person back there. There's another person. Anybody else? Just get your hand up. I want to see your hand. There's another person. Thank you. Anybody else? Real quick. There's another person. Going for God. See, I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Anybody else? Just needs to get right with God. There's four or five of you. There's six of you. Seven of you. Thank you. There's another one back here. Anybody else? I thought I saw one back here. Anybody else? You just need to go for God. You know, you know you haven't given God all of your heart. Listen to me. You know you haven't yet given God all of your life. You got him in your head. There's no doubt about it. You got him in your head. You know about Christmas. You know about Easter. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about you giving God all of your heart and all of your life. Knowing him in your head will not get you to heaven. Every one of us know who he is. There's six or seven of you. Anybody else? Anybody else real quick? I need to see your hand. If you're, if you're serious about God, just get your hand up. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? There's five, six of you, seven of you. I want you to, all, all five or six or seven of you, I want you to do this. And anybody that should have raised your hand but you didn't, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend. Get your stuff. I want you to get out of your seat, get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. Wait a minute. I'll tell, listen to what I'm going to say to you. If Jesus could walk a beaten, bloody road, beaten, you know, almost his life out of him, a beaten, bloody mess, people spitting at him and yelling at him and everything else publicly for you, then you can walk a safe church here. And I want you to know something. There's only about six or seven of you. There's ten more of you that need to stop messing with God, get out of your seat, and you come. You just nudge that person next to you and say, come on, I'll go with you if you need to go. That's all you need to say to them. But there's at least ten of you that need to come besides the six. That's 16 of you. I don't know how many of you will come. But if you want to get right with God, you don't get right with God just raising your hand. You get right with God by giving him all of your heart and all of your life. So I want you to get out of your seat, get your stuff, and meet me right here in front. Everybody that raised your hand, if you're serious, I want you to get up here. And anybody that should have raised their hand, I want you to get up here too. Right now. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Just as I am. Come on. Come on, 
you can come too. Come on. Just get out of your seat and come. Come on, let's go for Jesus. Come on. Come on, you can come too. Come on. If they're still coming, give them a hand as they come. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. Give them a hand as they come. Thank God you guys have come. Real quick, all of you look to your left. See this guy waving at you. His name is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a good guy. No weird stuff goes on. He's going to pray with you, give you some free information, and then uh, introduce you to a program we have that will help you get strong and encourage you called Spiritual personal trainers. He'll explain all that to you. Only takes a few moments. People you came with will wait for you, okay? So make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over that way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. 